from the vault, high atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking Catholic. I am Carrie Janice and I'm here with my co-host and good friend, Mike Walsh. Hey Mike, how's it going? Uh, you know, it's going well, Carrie. It is, uh, we're recording this, uh, you know, what, mid-June right now and it's hot outside and uh, we're almost past all the graduations that are going on, which is always a very uh, busy time for me and we're we're actually, by the time this airs, we'll have had our first ordination in the diocese, our three traditional, uh, traditional, that was a typo in a, in a uh, thing I wrote today, transitional uh, deacons uh, will happen this weekend. And I'm in a good mood. How about yourself? Are you going to be at the uh, diaconate ordination, by the way, Carrie? I am. I am excited. Yes, I had got an invite from one of the one of those that is being ordained, a good friend of mine, Carlo, who will be on next week's episode. So right. stay tuned for that when our diaconate, uh, our, our deacons at that point will be on. And uh, I'm excited for it. It's this Saturday. And then I'll be at the following Saturdays, also ordination for deacon, then soon to be priest, Father Gallagher and Father March. Yeah, this is always a... June is a, in my world, is always a very busy time for me, so I tend to get mm-hmm. uh, worn out, but it's also a time of great joy uh, when we can do these ordinations, and and a, a three-person diaconate ordination generally means that we get a three-person uh, priestly, God willing, a three-person priestly ordination in, in a year, and I am very excited at the fact that we've had a really good run over the last couple of years of ordaining, uh, I don't think I've done a single ordination since I've been here, I think they've all been two or more, um, and I'm really hoping that uh, continues far into the future and the you've actually we've uh, but you in particular have had a number of recent uh, priests and uh, soon to be priests on a variety of your shows over the last month um, and I gotta tell you that, that means I've got an opportunity to get to know them a little bit better and uh, they give me uh, great joy and great faith in the future of the church yes yeah, same here really excited actually today that the day we're recording it's kind of funny I always throw my son into a lot of these conversations but um, the today is his anniversary of his baptism, which I think hmm. all of us as Catholics should know when our baptism is and celebrate it. And we take that very serious in, in my household, at least with my son, and celebrate. And we're going to have a little, little dessert later tonight and all that. Aww. But I was looking through the pictures, and actually, to the, the priest that baptized him was a deacon, Father Josh Nevitt, my good friend who we've gotten to know recently. Yeah. And holding the book for Father Josh Nevitt at the time was seminarian, now deacon, soon to be priest. Father, uh, Deacon Peter Gallagher. So it's kind of funny. Like our my history with these guys goes far back, even beyond the last two years. So to see them and others in our diocese court get ordained, it's so beautiful. I get I get so excited for them. I mean, it's like I actually get more excited, I think, than attending a friend's wedding. It's just something very special about the priesthood that happens and about those ordinations. You know, that's that that's a really nice way of putting that because I'm I'm the same way. I like I try not to miss ordinations. Uh, let's face it, there are a lot of people who can get married. <clears throat> Not necessarily a lot of people who can get uh, get ordained, and there's just not a lot of ordinations that, that happen. Um, so I do get extra excited, and this year we actually are live streaming uh, for the first time, and not because we had to. We were, we were planning on doing this anyway. Uh, we're live streaming both the diaconate ordination and the priest ordination, and uh, I'll let this out now. We're going to record the first or live stream the first masses of each of the new uh, priests as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so because as I think people should be excited about this, and I want to make sure that they have access to it, um, because we are still limited on how many people can be can come to the ordinations mm-hmm. based on the rules in Jersey at, at the moment. Um, so it is invitation only. So it's going to be family and friends and clergy uh, from the from the diocese. And we'll be limited. I think uh, the ordination, the diaconate ordination is limited to like 200 people and the priest is uh, 300 people because they're, they're going to be held at different churches. But um, but so it's very exciting. And I hope the people who are listening uh, will go back if you haven't already seen it to check out the diaconate ordination. That's always beautiful. And then make sure you check out the uh, priest ordination uh, in two weeks on the, on the 20th. Um, the other thing to do is make sure, like Carrie just mentioned uh, a few moments ago, Make sure you check out each of the next uh, podcasts because we'll be talking to our most newly ordained uh, deacons and our, our transitional deacons and our most newly ordained uh, priests. And uh, knowing those five guys the way I do, I, I think you'll find it uh, fulfilling to to listen to it and see that we are, in fact, in, in good hands. And you yeah, also yeah. realize that, that in many ways, um, Carrie is the seminarian whisperer. 
So they all <laughs> seem to sort of like maybe a seminary and muse. I don't know how to describe you, but there are so many of these priests that you have uh, sort of helped guide along their path. Not and it's not your job. You're just friendly with them and you've gotten to know them and you encourage them. It's mm-hmm. really rather sweet. Yeah, it's it's a, it's special to know these young guys and watch them grow into their priesthood. It's really beautiful and help foster that along the way. And I think as a youth minister, um, it just it lends my my ministry lends itself to helping them. So I'm glad that I can be part of their journey. Well, and so if you haven't, um, if Mike mentioned about watching it, is what I was going to say is, Mike, I don't think you mentioned to our listeners where, so maybe some of the people aren't oh, exactly Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I'm so used to doing all these live streams, I just assume I everybody knows. Uh, so our live streams are going to be on the Diocese of Camden social media pages. They'll be on uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Periscope, as well as YouTube. Um, so you can check them all out at Camden Diocese, whatever your social media platform of choice is. Um, and we're we're very excited about that, and certainly check out the the podcast next week as well in our in your podcast feed. Um, but yeah, so it should be fun. And I, the the I should probably tell you that the well the diac by the time you're listening, the diaconate ordination would have been at ten thirty in the morning. The priest ordination will be at ten thirty in the morning on the twentieth of June, and then the first masses will be on Sunday at or the following Sunday at one thirty and three thirty respectively. So me and my fellow uh, live stream producer John Kalitz will have exactly forty five minutes to to turn around from one first mass to the next first mass and get it all set up for everybody. Fortunately, it's a seven minute ride from one location to the other, but we got that in the bag. Oh we man, you know, bow. we're so good. We can, we can do it in no time, that, but, uh, but is... I do hope everyone will check it out. Cause it's, it's a very exciting uh, day for new priests and, uh, and really one that's uh, it's really wonderful. So I'm looking forward to it. And I don't quite know how you snagged an invitation, though, uh, Carrie, except for the fact that you what are. What did you say? The, the whisperer? That yeah, yeah. When you're the whisperer, <laughs> you get you get the invitation. <laughs> That's how it goes. Actually, I have to say I was, like, really excited, blessed, and honored all at the same time to get the invitation. So um, so when they came in, I was like, yes, I'm so psyched because <laughs> I know what it means. It doesn't just mean you're all you're invited. It means you made the list because at this point, our, uh, our our churches are limited, as you mentioned earlier, Mike, with the restrictions. So, yeah. And I have a feeling you also go for the first blessing, too, right? I've been the first blessing a couple of times. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Do you know all the masses? And first confession, first confession, too. That was another honor. <laughs> you know what? All the ordinations I've ever done uh, for the diocese, I've never had an opportunity to get a first blessing or a first confession. Because I'm always so busy, I, I never get You're a chance. You're taking the photos. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, this time I'll be live streaming. Anyway, yeah. but we digress. We wanted to let we everyone digress. know this good, this good news. Up, though. Yeah, that, that there is lots of good news coming forward, not just in our diocese and dioceses across the country where mm-hmm. new, uh, new priests are going to be formed and ordained in the next uh, weeks. So this is the usual time of year when they happen, and we should take great joy in that. And much like you said about you know baptism, you know, don't forget your, your priest ordination— their, their ordination yeah. days are very important days in their lives. So if you don't know who your pat, what your pastor, or your priest, uh, uh, what day he was ordained, go find it out and give it. To, it's probably more important to them than their birthday. So maybe recognizing Absolutely, them yeah. on their on their ordination day would be very sweet. So Carrie, we are not here to talk about priests or ordaining people today. We have a much different guest. No, one, it's a different topic. It is, and one that I'm really looking forward to because it it it's in the uh, art realm and uh, not something. Even though you had last week's podcast was about poetry, which you and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Pete Sanchez did a great job with, uh, and now we go into a different form of art. I know. I'm so excited to have these back to back, actually, and because it is all in the form of art. But this is more in. Um, would you say, I guess, fine art or, and particularly performance art and with a Catholic flair, I should add. So I have my good friend, Mike Debus on today. So Mike, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hey, everybody. How are you? <laughs> and you might hear a little accent because he's from, I guess, would you call it the Midwest? I'm from the Midwest, born and raised, of course, okay. yep. This is a Jersey girl talking, so anything in the middle of the country, <laughs> I just lump it together, and sometimes I might get things wrong if it's Midwest or whatever it's called, Central. I don't know. So We're Midwest right, is correct. Yeah, right smack dab in the middle, actually. actually and that's Can- Kansas City? Kansas City. You got it. Matter of fact, when we were talking to him before the show started, the, the th- thing that popped into my head was, oh, man, I love talking to these guys because the Midwest nice comes out in no time. I love, I love Midwesterners. <laughs> They're always so kind and charitable. 
<laughs> yeah, I have uh, family out in St. Louis area, and they call it the Midwest there too. So, um, for those of you that don't know, if you're not if you're like me, that it just kind of lives in the corner of New Jersey and in the states and doesn't think beyond that. But anyway, I digress on that. So they, I love going to visit them because you do you hear it, it, it's a slower pace, it's a a, a genuine. Um, politeness and and people are just nicer i think than we find over here in the east coast new jersey new york philly area i agree to that would you mike we'll take it (laughs) but in addition to being midwest nice though you you are uh you're unique in in i almost have a hard time describing you so i was i was talking to my wife about having you on and it it I, so I was watching the videos and I didn't know about you until, until Carrie recommended you for the podcast. And so I did a little research and I saw what you did and it's like, it's, it's, this is going to sound, this is, I'm probably misstating this there. It was like watching a magician, uh, quite frankly. Mm. And <laughs> so there you are and you're, you're on the stage and you're against a blank canvas, uh, usually yep. black as I, yep. from one of the videos I saw. Yep. And then you begin moving about the stage and over the course of when we'll talk about this a little bit so many minutes sure. behind you this 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 painting begins to form and yeah. the way you do it 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 there is a sense of like wonderment about it and, and i know this is an audio podcast and we're going to do a terrible job i'm going to do a terrible job of explaining this um <laughs> but mike sort of you know, before we get into how you started can you explain what your yeah. stage show looks like yeah, of course. Um, and uh, that's a good description of stage show. And uh, the term that I like to use and then other other artists that do the same thing that, that I do, uh, we use the term performance painting. Some will call it speed painting mm-hmm. or live painting. I like to use the word performance painting. Uh, but yeah, you would start with a blank canvas and it's a combination of creating a, an image, a painting, with traditional brushes and and paints, but it's also done to music. And so it's a performance and it's really creating art and intertwining entertainment. So when, not to kind of get into my story, but that is something that I've had to learn over time because it's not a natural thing for me to get up on a stage and to perform, but it was something that I was invited into and it's really been a journey for me and to get through my thick head that <laughs> I am an entertainer and that I need to focus on mm-hmm. entertaining the crowd and combining the elements of music and movement and painting all into one. So, so let's go back to the beginning, right? You were, you're mm-hmm. born and raised in, in where? In Kansas City. Yep. I'm a, I currently live in Kansas City, Missouri, but... Let it be known that I'm a Kansas boy. All right. So I was born and raised in, uh, in Kansas City, Kansas, and I've been here all my life. This is home to me. Okay. So Kansas City, Kansas, true Midwesterner to, to the core. Yep. Um, how, does a, how does a true Midwesterner sort of, first of all, where do you find an interest in art? Let's start with that, because I think I get the impression you were a painter before you were anything else. Yeah. I, as far back as my memory goes... I was creating, I was drawing, I was painting. I remember back when I was a little kid, five, six years old, as far as my memory can take me, my parents used to drag out this little kid's picnic table, put it in the kitchen, in the kitchen where there's a linoleum floor. And they basically fill the table with crayons, markers, glue, construction paper, and they'd invite my neighbor friends over and we would just have at it and we'd make all kinds of things. And I was your typical little boy. And I was making pictures of my favorite superheroes, you know, drawing pictures of cars and trucks, uh, my favorite athletes, Mm -hmm. things like that. And, and And not, not only drawing with them, but drawing them well. Well, in my mind, of course. (laughs) And your mom's mind, I bet too. (laughs) My mom's mind. And you know, the refrigerator was my first art gallery. Uh (laughs) My parents would proudly display my works of art on the refrigerator. And whatnot. Yeah. Do so, you have one that you remember, like from your first memory, like that you were like super proud of, and it was that moment where you saw it was good, and you said to yourself, "Like I have talent." Do you remember that? Moment? Um, that might have come from junior high school, but I do remember I was a big 
I'm dating myself here, but I was a big Oakland A's fan as a growing up as a kid. And mm-hmm. I remember out of construction paper trying to make the entire starting lineup of the Oakland A's out of construction <laughs> paper. <laughs> You know, of course, the arms came out of what you know where the ears are supposed to be. And, you know, that's how that's how kids see the 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 figure at that uh, stage in life. That's pretty funny because girls make paper dolls, boys make paper lineups <laughs> with their baseball team. <laughs> well said. Well said. So and, you you start out, you know, typical kid, uh, and you know, enjoys you know drawing and painting and creating, you know, construction paper, you know, athletes. But how did, so what, where do you move next? Like, so I'm assuming that's grade school. Does, do do you get any formal training along the way? Well, once I got into junior high and high school, I, uh, like any other student, we have the opportunity to take electives Mm -hmm. and I began to fill my electives, uh, with art classes. It was, it was, uh, something that I loved. It was something that I enjoyed doing, of course. And I, I thought I was decent at it, and uh, I also needed something to get my GPA up to a respectable <laughs> level. <so. laughs> There's the practical side as well. Yeah, smart. <laughs> <laughs> were they different? Were they different electives, as in like painting, sculpture, design? Like, were there different ones across the across the gamut in the art field? So, in regards to in in regards to school, uh, you know, in art class, you're doing all kinds of different stuff. You're doing ink drawings, you're doing pencil drawings, you might explore with clay, um, all kinds of different stuff. But I always went back uh, to drawing with pencils, and that was really uh, kind of my strong point mm-hmm. in using dry mediums. Not to get too too far ahead here, but I actually didn't start painting and using paints and getting comfortable with paints until I was out of college. Not really. Wow, that comes as a surprise to me. You, so you never well, you never really painted before that. Well, I'm a control freak, and <laughs> and you can't you you can't control paint as well right. as you can control a pencil or a dry medium like a charcoal. Sure. Or a uh, or a pastel, or you know a piece or a piece of paper. So I stayed away from that. I was I was afraid of paint because it could run on you. You had to blend it. You had to mix it. Mm-hmm. And I wanted nothing to do with that back in my <laughs> younger years. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Were you a, were you a Catholic school kid or a public school kid? Public school kid. Okay. Uh, my dad actually tried to get me to transfer to the Catholic high school that he went to back in the day uh, after I believe my freshman year in high school, but I didn't want anything to do with it. It didn't have anything to do with the Catholic school, the Catholic faith, but I already had my circle of friends established and I had some great friends and I was very comfortable where I was and I I didn't want to uh, change that. Uh, But I, yeah, uh, public school kid, uh, but born and raised Catholic, cradle Catholic, and uh, and still Catholic today by the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> awesome to hear that. The uh, so you you go in you go through high school and you have a few more classes. Now at, at any point along in these younger years, are you displaying any of your art other than the other than the refrigerator? <laughs> so, um, basically, you know, not in high school. I'm trying to think back to my high school days. Uh, there was probably times when um, throughout the school year, your work got displayed in the hallway or maybe in the, in the cafeteria. I don't uh, really recollect that. But once I got into the working world in my first job, which was at an apparel company and I was in their graphics department, uh, there were a lot of artists that worked at the company that I worked at and they would, they would hold an art show every year and anybody in the company could enter. You didn't have to work in the art department and they would put on one heck of an art show and they have, they would have prizes and I would always enter something in the art show. And, um, that was kind of a springboard that played, that played a role in, uh, in, in me, uh, advancing on 
uh, to where I would eventually become a full-time artist yeah. in, in the, in the fashion that I am now. I didn't know it at the time, but that certainly played a role. So that, that, so let's go backwards a little bit. The, um, yep. when you go to college is your, in your college years, is this, do you go into graphic design? I did. I was a business major my first year in college. And then I, I quickly realized that, uh, that wasn't my strength <laughs> and that I, and then I, uh, I reverted back to transition to uh, my strengths, which was in the art field. So mm -hmm. uh, after my first year in college, I became an art major. And where'd you go to college? I bounced around uh, a few <laughs> different schools. Like a good uh, artist should. <laughs> I, yeah. I always, my, when I tell my story, I always, I always say, my poor parents. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the stress and worry I put them through. But I uh, ended up at uh, University of Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, home of the Jayhawks, and uh, entered their art program and, and graduated with a, uh, a visual arts degree okay. at KU. Nice. Now, Very Carrie, nice. you went to school for graphic arts, too? I did, yeah. I, uh, so it's funny because I, I, I originally started, I wanted to do more of a performance art, actually. So I picked my college. I don't know if you ever heard this, Mike. I don't think so. Rowan, U Rowan University, I picked that intentionally. One, because it was in the state, so I wanted to stay in state um, mm -hmm. just to be a little more local but far further enough to go away from where I you know, live away from home. Sure. And two, because they had graphic design and puppetry. So I thought puppetry <laughs> would be a cool way to make your art and then perform with it, right? So, um, but like you, Mike, I quickly realized that my skills maybe didn't lie there and also that a job maybe didn't lie there. So I um, made sure that I got all my graphic design classes in to get a degree mo mainly in graphic design with just a few puppetry classes to have that performance. So fast forward, uh, my art turned into what I do with my entertainment field, which is uh, making balloon art, face painting, and stilt walking, which is where the performance kind of comes in. I make the balloons from the stilt. So I, I have my, my art still is in my side business. Of course, my full-time job is youth ministry. That's where the Lord called me to, but uh -huh. mainly, but the, the entertainment side of me is still there and the art roots are still definitely there um, as well. So that's where, where it all ties together for me. So now that's interesting. So the person who wanted to do performance art is the person who's not doing performance <laughs> art, except in sort of a, this is this very uh, specific area. The guy yep. who had no intention of doing anything related to performance, just wanted to be a, a good artist. Somehow, yep. uh, someone working, the, the voice of God working through another human being, this person says to you, hey, how, would you do some performance art? Now, this is what I can't quite understand. If someone came to me and said, hey, Mike, could you do some p performance photography for what? And my answer would be no. That's not even a thing. I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> how, how do you respond to, to at, at why a why are you asking? To how were you? How do you respond to someone making such a to me bizarre request? I am so glad you asked this question because I was going to ask the same one. <laughs> I really wanted to know the root of this question. So here we go. Could you? Hey, Mike, could you re-ask the question real quick? It kind of got a little... Oh, uh, I oh, I was so articulate before. Okay. So I, I'm curious, what was, you know, what was the impetus to go from just being a, an artist to a performance artist? You know, like if someone were to ask me that, oh, yeah. I, I would have sure. shot that down in 10 seconds. But you seem to have been very open to it. So Well, uh, honestly speaking... Yeah. I shot it down in about five seconds. <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> and that's and that <laughs> that's true. So at the time, I was freelancing. This is way back in two thousand eight, and um, uh, an acquaintance of mine in Kansas City, uh, a gentleman, was putting on uh, what was called KCYC, Kansas City Youth Conference mm -hmm. or Catholic Youth Conference, and. It was uh, every off year of NCYC. Oh, that's so cool. Every I wish we had year, that. He would, yeah, he would put on a, a youth conference here in Kansas City, Missouri, unbeknownst to me. Uh, I was just my, doing my thing as a freelance artist, uh, basically taking commissions from clients and creating what they would request. And that's how I made a living. And it, and it was a very frugal living at that. <laughs> but I received this call from uh, John Schaffhausen, who was the youth director on the, on the Missouri side. And he calls me out of the blue and he says, Hey, Mike, I know you're an artist. I know you're freelancing right now. And 
Uh, just turns out I'm putting on the youth conference in a few months. And uh, I think he'd seen something creative at a youth conference that he attended. I think that's part of the story. And he asked me, he said, uh, hey, at uh, KCYC in November, would you have any interest in getting on stage and painting uh, an image of, of Jesus live on stage? And if my memory serves me correctly, as uh, quickly, quickly as I could answer, I said, uh, no, 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 thank you. I don't think that's, uh, that's not what I do. And, um, and, uh, but I appreciate you asking me. So I did turn, I did turn the opportunity down. Um, had no desire to, to get on stage, to paint in front of anybody. It just seemed very foreign and very in- intimidating to me. But uh, he did challenge me to think about it before we, we got off the phone. Okay. And, uh, and, and typi- then over the – yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, and typically, you know, just to add a little, you know, sort of uh, explanation to this, how long would it usually mm, take you to, to paint a painting? Or do whatever form of art, chalk or pencil yep. or, or anything? So, so my style of work back then – uh, was very representational. It, I wanted the image that I was going to create to be uh, as as close to the image or the, uh, the, the referenced photo that I was working from mm-hmm. or the reference material that I was working from. So it would take, uh, gosh, a, a, a shorter piece in, in time, time-wise would probably take a few days. Mm-hmm. So anywhere from three days to a week, some projects lasted Three weeks to to maybe even you know a month or six six weeks. So not the th- kind of thing you could ever do on a stage. This would be correct. <laughs> in, a, in a, let's say a one <laughs> hour presentation. Different. Not even yeah. an hour. We're talking speed painting. So this is even right. quicker. And and I, if I, if I'm following you correctly with the KCYC, that's for, for youth, right? So youth want something quick. They're not going to look sit there for an hour watching you paint, right? Cor- correct. You know, and, and that certainly didn't help John Sells pitch when he told me <laughs> my audience was only going to be 500 high school kids. Right. <laughs> so that sounds like the most intimidating audience you could come up with. So right. sorry. Not I, far not off. <laughs> and, you know, going back to the sort of the, this performance angle, um, I'm going to assume I could be wrong. But I'm going to assume you were not a dancer in your younger days or gymnast. Well, not a gymnast, but one of my actually one of my passions is dance. Really, uh, oh, I love to dance. Cool. I could hold my own at any wedding reception. I could hold my own at any school mixer. Uh, nice. I wasn't trained in it. I was going to but... say self-taught dance. Like, oh you, yeah, you, you go know, to a raise, party raise, and you gyrate. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Gyrate might be a little strong, but <laughs> I was, uh, I'm dating myself here, but, uh, you know, back in the day when MTV played music videos mm-hmm. and, and you would pick up all your dance moves from, uh, from your favorite entertainers. Yeah. Nice. So but, like, a lot of high school kids, a lot of high school kids love to dance, right? Yeah, sure. And yeah. They're in the basement, you know, uh, whatever. And, uh, that was something I always loved to do. Uh, so, Little did I know that uh, I would one day rely upon those, <laughs> that those, is cool. those, those gifts that God gave me that uh-huh. I were long gone. So a self-taught MTV dancer who happens to be a self-taught <laughs> artist, visual artist, some guy, and now, now I'm curious, the, the, the fellow that asked you to do this, did he know about your dancing abilities? Well, no, and I didn't need... I didn't need I do need to make something clear. When I, when I first started doing live performance painting, a speed painting for me, like the first time I ever did this, uh, the, the painting probably took 30 to 35 minutes. Okay. I really didn't know what real performance painting was until a few years later when somebody sent me a video of probably, you know, one of the, one of the best performance painters around. And then I, I saw what a real performance, what, real performance painting was so you know for the first couple of years i would basically just stand there and paint the picture mm-hmm. mm. and, I, and i would try to paint it as quickly as i could and i didn't realize that to captivate an audience you actually had to be entertaining you had to be fast you had to make things look easy and natural 
when maybe they weren't. Right. Now, like, when, like a, like a well-trained athlete. In those early days, were you talking to the audience while you were painting or was it literally come and watch me paint? Yeah, it was a second. It was, it was watch, watch the image unfold before your eyes. I was playing music from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, music speaks to everyone. It's universal language. So you want that as part of, I wanted that to be part of the presentation. But yeah, I wasn't moving around for the first couple, two, three years. How was it like when starting off? So you did the first event. Well, let's hear about that first event and then we'll go on. I want to hear about it because how'd it go? Was, did it go well? Did it go the way you planned? Was it well, nerve wracking? It, it was actually on my birthday. Uh, oh. I was a nervous wreck, of course. I didn't like to get up in front of people. Uh, didn't like to, speaking in front of me. I didn't have to speak, but you know, get a presentations just getting them from people was not my comfort zone and a lot of people are that way and i was no exception uh but you know the day the event came and i got up there there was actually a praise and worship band on stage very very talented very gifted very beautiful and uh they drowned out any noise that might be coming from the audience which, which was very helpful but i got up there i did the painting and you know, walked off stage and much to my surprise, I, I survived. It didn't kill me. And, uh, was there a I terror by any chance or were you comfortable? Uh, no, I was very, I was very nervous. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and truth be known, I still get nervous. I still yeah. get, I'm not, I'm not as nervous, mm -hmm. but, but I still get nervous. And maybe that's just, you know, I'm self, I'm human. I'm self-conscious concerned mm -hmm. about, you know, how people, how people are going to respond, react, uh, to, to well, what I, you play it off very well. Cause I've, I've seen you perform and you don't look nervous at all. So from an outside perspective, you don't see it. I appreciate so, that. You know. I'm Thank curious, Carrie, where did you see him first? Uh, and NCYC right. 2009, which was right after that, like almost yeah. immediate. Like, wow, that's actually, year. that's a quick jump from, from, you know, your regional conference to the national conference so quickly. Well, it was in CYC in 2009 was in Kansas city, Missouri. Ah, mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the gentleman who was in charge of the thematic park actually approached me about helping with the theme, with the, uh, what was called the art corner mm -hmm. in the thematic park because mm -hmm. he knew I was an artist. And, uh, so he actually had another lady in charge and I helped out brainstorming some different ideas for kids to do what creative activities to do in the art corner. And they also said, Oh, because you do, you know, this live painting thing, we're going to put a little stage in there. So it wasn't like all of a sudden I wasn't known nationally or something like that. It was okay. right here in the, in my backyard. Yeah. Which was, which was fortunate for me. I was really excited because I was immediately drawn to your Jesus because that image of Jesus, I, I'm curious, is that the image you painted at the KCYC? It's, well, it's the same face. Same but face. It's not, picked, it's not the same finished painting. Gotcha. So that uh, was the image that drew me in that image, right? It's behind yeah. you in our, in our podcast here, but it's yeah. also hanging on, hanging on the wall of my youth office Wonderful. <laughs> since 2009. Wow. <laughs> Wait, it, the the painting in your youth uh, office is uh, an original, or was it a print? Karen? No, it's print. He was selling prints and then would hand sign them, and that's when I went up and said, "I love your art, I'll yeah. buy one." But here's the full story. The reason why we got more connected, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember this, Mike? You best try you know, me. Just, okay, you, you know, but it's okay. So <laughs> I was so excited to get this painting as somebody that loves art, loves the Lord. I was super excited, hand signed by an artist. It was a print, but hand signed. And that was the only, the one and only year. It was the best year. We got to fly to NCYC from New Jersey to Kansas City. And we had a quick layover and we were about to miss our flight because the first flight was delayed. You know how this goes, right? So we're, we're like running off the one airplane to get to the next airplane. I'm in charge of the nine people that went that year. Or maybe it was 11 of us, something like that. Anyway, I'm in charge of them. We're all get, like rushing off the plane. And I left the tube on the airplane, the tube of the poster. Oh, no. And I had his um, business card, though. I had gotten his business card and threw in a bag with all the other freebie stuff that you get from the, from the NCYC thematic park. 
And when I got home, I realized I left it on the plane. I was so upset. And then I found his card when I was going through my bag of stuff. So I think I emailed you and then you called me back. I think I put my cell phone or something or was in, in my email and you called me back and we had a little conversation and you mailed me one out for free. And I always thought that was such a genuine oh. act to do that. And Going back That's to our earlier friend. going back to our earlier conversation about Midwest Nice. <laughs> there it is. There That's your it example is. of Midwest there. Nice. <laughs> so you yes. know what? So Actually, the- for some of our listeners, Carrie, um, I, we've been talking about KCYC and NCYC, and I'm not sure we've done a very good job of explaining what that is. Yeah, for, sorry. for people who aren't um, used to it. NCYC is the National Catholic Youth Conference. It happens every two years put on by NCFYM, National, I I don't know what all the initials are, but it's the National Federation for Youth Ministry. And uh, it's an amazing event. It draws in the biggest speakers from from the Catholic world, like Jason Everett, Leah Darrow, uh, Sarah Swafford, just all the big names as keynote speakers and breakout sessions. And it's really a phenomenal experience for you. Uh, But there is a lot of different other things like, intertwined into it like the thematic park that mike did mention which is an area where you can actually go and talk to the presenters you can buy merchandise there in this particular one they had the art section where you can have some hands-on creative creativity but all based around the catholic faith and uh, i have to say it's really one of the highlights of my youths uh ever, you know, of the youth ministry experience which happens every two years so sometimes, as Mike mentioned, in the bigger diocese, in the off year, they'll also do a smaller conference, more local based, which which is KCYC, mm-hmm. Kansas City Youth Conference. So, okay. uh, so those are the different youth conferences. And we, we did an episode on NCYC back in November. So listeners yeah, probably scroll that. back to that. Yes, yes, listeners. Remember, you. Whenever Carrie and I get on the on a track where we're like, "What are they talking about?" We probably had something, uh, an entire podcast about it within the last year. There you go. So you can always check back on those things, but also tweet at us and say you didn't explain what you were talking about. So feel free mm-hmm. to do that too. We try to catch each other with it. We we do a pretty good job with that. And you know, we should uh, one other little bit of business. Uh, we are doing this via a Zoom call as we usually have to do nowadays. But in this case, it's because the dude's in uh, halfway across the country, so was, mm-hmm. we weren't going to fly him out for a podcast but um he was good enough to set up all of his art behind him so i think i will have to uh, share some uh, photos from our zoom call because his background looks great my oh, background me. looks terrible and just letting you know now carrie didn't know we were going to be on camera so her hair is not done so don't yeah. be upset she's very upset with herself <laughs> so if i post a photo from this don't be upset um, Thanks, Mike. But but it's true. So I'm looking through an entire wall of art behind you, and I'm and I'm going to ask a question that's going to lead to a second question. Uh, I do see the original uh, Jesus photo or painting behind you, but I also see uh, a couple of Kansas City chief paintings, a couple of uh, Kansas City royal paintings behind you. So yep. I, I'm going to say that you do more than just uh, spiritual based painting. Uh, were those? I'm curious. Were those commissioned or were those part of um, things you've done? at other similar events? Uh, these were not, uh, the, yeah, your your second uh, answer. These are images that I've created at other events. And anytime I paint at an event, uh, I always practice the images before I before I uh, perform as, as many times as I can. So I actually have stacks and stacks of practice pieces. Okay. Um, some of these pieces, for instance, this one here, this Patrick Mahomes piece, here before our beloved chiefs uh went to the super bowl this year i'll have you know by the way i was rooting hard on the chiefs Uh, we all were we're we're andy readers we we are we are that's we're from philly so we are beloved of andy reed thank you so much we were so happy you guys won congratulations we were very happy for you (laughs) it was not looking good there for most of the game we were just like oh we find we're finally gonna lay our egg Nah, we're big red fans. We could we were we were thrilled he got his ring. And same thing with Mahomes too. Big Mahomes. Appreciate fan. It. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. image here though, I, I I wanted to create a uh a a video leading up to the Super Bowl. There's so you know, everything marketing and building your brand, if you want to use that term, is so much of that is done online and social media. So I wanted to I had this idea to create kind of a motivational inspirational chiefs video lead, leading up to the uh super bowl so i painted a, some of the uh, star chiefs players and turned it into a video and this is uh the image i painted 
That's beautiful. This is another image I painted. Now, this one I've painted live uh, a few times. This is uh, the Kansas City Royals uh, beloved catcher, Salvador Perez, who's just Mr. Personality uh, galore. You captured his smile perfectly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I do some patriotic images. So you'll see uh, an image of this uh, this, uh, bust, an eagle bust with a flag behind it. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, no, the, the, the artwork, yeah. the quality of the artwork is great. And, and I, I don't want to give your, your performance short trip because we haven't exactly got to the performance description yet. So sure. you, you learn, so, so you start performing on stage, uh, but very basic, like this is a, we'll have music in the background. This is how I create a, a, a painting. Um, yeah. now let's talk to where does, how do you make that jump from, you, you said you somebody sent you a video. How did you get accustomed to making that jump from standing in front of people painting to dancing in front of people painting with a spinning, uh, um, uh, you know, what's the word? Like a canvas behind you. Canvas. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah, so early, it's funny. Early on, I used to basically take black paper and tape it to a wall. And that's what I used as a canvas. I would basically wow. paint on paper. Everything started very, very basic, um, very simple. And I think there's a there's a lesson in there somewhere, a life lesson where you don't have to have everything figured out to start on a new a new venture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all this evolved over time. I started watching videos from other performance painters and it seems like painting on black backgrounds uh, was uh, typical. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, and then because you're an entertainer, you need to come up with different gimmicks and different ways of entertaining your audience and keeping them captivated, keeping them in suspense. Part of that is using a canvas that spins and turns. So you can be painting something upside down or sideways and then spin it for effect or during what they call the reveal, you can turn it from upside down to right side up and you have that aha moment Mm -hmm. where everybody just like, sometimes when I'm on stage and, uh, you really surprise the audience. You hear this, like you hear everybody gasp at once. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> they they that finally that. realize what you've uh, been creating. Um, the black background is used uh, as shadow. So one of the keys in performance painting is to create an image as quickly as you can. Uh, and you want to use that black back, that black background or anything that's in shadow uh, from your image, you can just use the black, so you don't have to. Uh, paint so the it's, entire it's, canvas. it speeds up your uh, your how you, quickly you can get it done. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly. smart. Yeah. Using the all, negative. The, all these things I I you know I took from other people, right? You see them using these tricks and gimmicks, and and uh, you implement them into your own your own. Uh, performance you know that's the thing that gets me is that the artistry the art (laughs) so the artistry of the 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 painting or the drawing or the pencil stencil it's all amazing in and of itself but the fact that you've you've married it to this this what we call it i call it a dance but all this theatrics and it really comes across like performance performance. i know i'm (laughs) I'm looking for other words i got a thesaurus full of words in my head um (laughs) but it's really impressive that you it it, it takes it out of just not that i mean the thing is is on their own they're gorgeous and then you marry to this this performance and it really elevates it. I, I'm curious from a, a spiritual perspective. Maybe, Carrie, this might even be a question more for you. Um, mm-hmm. Seeing something unfold like that, you know, spiritually, and, and not in not just the artistic awe of it, but like, how did it affect you the first time you've seen it? Oh, I think it's you know, I think it was amazing, beautiful, touching. Uh, for me, I've always admired style uh, a stylistic that is like a little more i guess you could say like gritty and and raw rather than maybe back to your older days mike where things were a little bit more perfect and controlled mm-hmm. i like things that are personally just me it's more appealing to me that are a little bit more loose and mm-hmm. just like has that little flair to them and that is actually what drew me in and then i saw the performance so that as you mentioned mike was like you're just like, oh my gosh, this is a second layer of awesomeness. Like, I can't believe it. 
from a spiritual perspective, I would say, you know, if, if I, I watch some of your videos online, you know, I follow you on Facebook, you know, just things that are not spiritually based and watching them unfold. I would say for me, it's just um, more of the aha. But when it's a, an image of Our Lady, Mother Teresa, I have a shirt actually that you, you painted the design and it's printed on the shirt of Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. And um, w when you see them painted actually live, it does actually hit, uh, and I think anything of faith does this, a conversation, um, the poetry that we heard last week, anything that is of faith, it does hit you on a deeper level and kind of tugs at that part of your heart that you're just like, this is awesome and it's faith-based. Yeah. That is deep. <laughs> and that's where it goes for me with Mike, Mike Debus's work. I'm curious, wow. Mike. Um, how do you come up with what your subject matter is going to be, particularly in in the in the spiritual realm? Do you, you get requests from like the organizers for something, or do you mm -hmm. like how do you kind of come to that conclusion of what you're going to paint? Yeah, a lot of times it is from uh, it, it is uh, connected to the event I'm going to paint at, uh, but you know, as a Catholic, uh, I've developed kind of a library of Catholic imagery that I can use at all kinds of different Catholic events, whether it's a, a youth conference or a parish mission, um, you know, these images that are kind of the, uh, the pillars of our faith, if you will, you know, the face of Jesus, the blessed mother, the Holy spirit, uh, the face of God. And, uh, you know, these, these images are, are, are going to speak to, you know, Catholics far and wide. Um, and uh, in my presentation, when I paint at a youth conference, I want to use those images that uh, everybody's going to recognize as near and dear to their Catholic faith. Um, instead of painting maybe some obscure saint that, that uh, they might recognize a name, but at, when the paintings and they would have no idea, yeah. but they can't think of an, an image of what that saint might look like. Yeah. So do you, uh, do you get requests and do you, uh, do you like if someone were to contact you on Facebook or, or go to your website and made a request for a specific kind of a painting, would you, do you accommodate? Do you accept, you know, commissioned items? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I take, uh, take requests. And if I have enough time to develop a new image before an event, it does take a number of days to create a new image and to practice and rehearse that image before, uh, what I call, you know, stage ready. Um, I do try to, I do offer, you know, quite a repertoire of images that I've already created. And so I, I do have, a conversation with any client that contacts me on what's already available. Mm -hmm. But then uh, oftentimes uh, we have the conversation about, you know, is it, is there something that uh, they would like that I, I'm not painting at the time. Yeah. Carrie, do you have any requests? <laughs> <laughs> My son, John Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Typical I'm mom. just curious, do people, do, <laughs> right? Do people commission you to do any like family portraits or like self portraits or anything of non famous people? Just the average person contact you for something like that ever? I, I do get requests from people from time to time, but that's really, uh, I when, when, you know, actually right now, because of the situation we're in with with the COVID-19 situation, all my events have been canceled. I don't right. think my next event is till, till late August. I am actually doing commission work right now. Mm -hmm. Most of that is in the style of my performance painting. Um, when things are busy, you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, I really don't have time to, to take commissions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all that's changed for the time being. Um, but normally how do you I like that do you like that change is it is it a good change or? this is this actually has been a very this has been a big blessing for me mm -hmm. uh things can get really crazy especially when you're traveling and you're you need to practice new images you're taking phone calls you're trying to run a business and you know that's that's not my passion uh i love to create i love to draw i love to paint just when i'm painting uh, that's when I'm in in my zone. That's that's my happy place, 
and that's what I love to do. And uh, I've been able to do more of that now than I have in a long time. Kind of harkens back to our conversation a few weeks ago, Carrie, doesn't it? When we had the host phone, you were talking about how uh, sure. this, that there has been silver linings with this time that we've been able to spend more time doing the things we like to do versus the things we have to do to cash a paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I feel you, Mike, I actually, I'm sitting behind with a piece of it, but I got to paint a mural in my son's room of some of his favorite characters. And, nice. uh, and I, I had been putting it on the back burner forever. I wanted to do it for a long time. And yeah. I was like, I got the time. And it's really funny. When when the lockdown started, I literally went to Walmart, bought all the paint and said, I'm doing this before the lockdown's <laughs> over. And it happened. And it happened. So it's true. There's a silver lining. It's not commission work. It's just, but it's make my son happy work, yeah. which was in the zone. I, when you said in the zone, I, I used that line actually describing uh, the feeling I got while painting because I haven't had it in a long time because I haven't had time to do it. So it, it, it does feel good. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad that you have had that blessing for yourself and are still able to to make a living off of it. That is a great, great blessing for you. Yeah. You, you know, Should Mike, we? I'm curious um, and feel free uh-huh. to not a- answer this question. I'm, I'm going to ask you a, po- a potentially embarrassing question. Uh-huh. You know, performance is performance and it's and it sometimes it can feel rote and sometimes it can become rote and through but through that rote uh things tend to become easier because you're just doing the same thing the same motions all the time uh-huh. i have to imagine that in in when you're doing this the, this performance art um that it is possible to how shall we say screw up the painting and <laughs> I was thinking of that. <laughs> are you able, like, like if you realize you've, I don't know, you've used the wrong brushstroke, or you suddenly realize that you were going to paint one thing and you've started painting another thing, are you able to like correct midway, or has this not happened to you because you're just so perfect? <laughs> <laughs> What was the next question after that one? <laughs> no secrets revealed on the podcast. <laughs> I, will, I will say that uh, I think I was painting uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the dove uh, image at one time, which is right behind me here. Oh, it's beautiful. And uh, I, was, I was spinning the canvas, and I think I dipped my brush in some paint, and I, I did one of my spin, not spinning myself, yeah. right? one of my moves, if you will. And I think my brush accidentally just swiped right across the uh, dove's wing. Like he, uh, I just slashed, oh, no. <laughs> slashed off the, uh, the wing of the Holy spirit. Um, so things do happen. Uh, I once heard another friend of mine who's a, a performer say, you know, if you do mess up, just keep going because the audience does not know what to expect. That's yeah, right. That's it. Yep. I, listen, and everything is fixable in art. Everything it's is true. Fixable. That's the paint's true. still wet, right? That's true. Yeah. Every time we do a podcast, we realize there was a question we didn't ask or something like that. And then, then we have to tell ourselves, it's like, oh, yeah, we're the only ones that know we screwed up uh, as a general mm-hmm. rule. It may have been a bad podcast, but we're the only ones we we screw up what we didn't <laughs> yeah. do. Same thing with my photography. Like, I'll go, th- you know, I'll shoot 600 photographs at an event or something like that and then realize that I wasn't set right or I had my settings wrong and it drives me up a wall. And then, uh, you know, one of my colleagues came to me like, yeah, nobody knows you screwed that shot up except for you. So don't worry about it. It's like you, right. you'll live. The uh, Well, you know, as we're, we're kind of wrapping up, you know, I, I wanted to give you plug you a little bit. What's the best way for people to see the work you've done or maybe inquire about your services? Sure. So uh, go to my website, which is MikeDebus.com. They can find me on Instagram, which is at MikeDebus. Or they can just go on Facebook and in their search, uh, just type in Mike Debus. And Debus is D as in David, E as in Edward, B as in boy, U.S. as in Uncle Sam. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can find me there as well. Yeah. And Carrie, I, I have to believe at some point you're going to figure out a way to get him out to Jersey, right? It's happening, especially right. after this. That's what and I like we to could hear. Do, and then we could do a Facebook Live event for the camera. <laughs> Would love it. Would love it. <laughs> Uh, put in the budget for July 1st, Mike. 
<laughs> well, that's great. Carrie, thank you very much for setting this up. And Mike, thank you very yeah, much for awesome. uh, agreeing to, to be on the podcast. Uh, I do very much look forward to Carrie figuring out a way getting out to the Diocese of Camden and to Jersey. And uh, we'll show you where, uh, where you know, Andy really came to fame before he got to Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. I really appreciate you guys having me on. This has been great. No worries. It's been awesome. Listeners, thank you very much. And uh, come back uh, next week. We'll talk to you later. God bless.